Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Friedrich. I'm a data enthusiast. And the reason that I really enjoy data is because what I what I feel is amazing about it is can, it can kind of help us understand the world and see things about the world that aren't obvious. So I actually want to make a little challenge here in the in the chat. If anyone knows what is on that picture, um, please post it. Um, uh, maybe I want to give you a little bit of a background um, on um, how I got interested in following the money. So for the last 10 years or so, I've been working with investigative reporters and other investigators um, who are looking into the underbelly of society, corruption, crime, money laundering, stealing money, basically. And um, so in that course, the idea has always been can we get data that um, help, t tells these investigators where there are signs of crime, corruption, of misdoing, of um, uh, illicit activity um, that exists? And so why is this important? And I think maybe a few, few of you know it, as um, Tony has just won the prize. It is Putin's palace on this picture, right? So this is a house that many investigative journalists and many people in general believe is owned more or less directly by Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. The construction cost for it must have been in the billions, and that's not counting the um, many vineyards and other kind of side properties that are, that are around it. And when you look at something like this, obviously, like, why shouldn't the president of Russia live in a nice crib? But there's an opportunity cost to this, right? What each of these pillars symbolizes is a loss of healthcare, is a loss of quality in the education system, is the lack of availability um, of public services in the Russian Federation for the citizens who live there. It turns out that also a lot of money was stolen from the military. So in that case, we can count it as a win. Um, but um, in general, corruption hurts countries, it hurts democracies. Um, and it hurts the rule of law. And that's why I think it's really important that there are investigators both within the government, but also in civil society, whether they're journalists or activists, who try and track how um, money is being stolen. And um, what kind of questions do these people want to ask? Um, they want to ask investigative questions that would generate leads, that would generate examples of a pattern that can then lead into an investigation. So, um, for example, can I find links from a politician in my country, Vladimir Putin, to an offshore company? Can I find links from a politician's spouse to the government procurement contracts in my country, right? Is there a piece of road that was supposed to be built, but it hasn't been built, but the contract went to um, a, a firm that's linked to the government, that's linked to someone who is involved in spending the budget money? And um, more recently, also, I think there's been a lot of attention on, on international sanctions. So can I see all the companies owned by sanctioned entities? In fact, what many countries have is these rules, um, like in the US and the EU, saying if there's a company that is owned by a sanctioned company, it is implicitly also sanctioned. Um, maybe a little bit of a background. Why am I talking about sanctions? So two years ago, um, I started a project called Open Sanctions. Um, which takes some of the technology that I've been working on previously for investigative journalists and makes it into a um, due diligence data set that can be used for free by civil society, by journalists, by activists, but that's also available as a, as a commercial product for financial services industries and other people who want to uh, do anti-money laundering due diligence um, and want to understand what risk their business is exposed to. And I think there's a really nice overlap there. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to combine data from a great variety of sources, right? Whether it's um, just in terms of the questions we're just asking, right? Whether we need to understand offshore companies, we need to understand um, sanctions, we need to understand who are politicians, we need to understand who owns what businesses, we need to understand government procurement, um, and so on. Um, and we need to kind of take all this data in the different formats in which it exists and bring it into a coherent form so we can use it. We also then want to be able to kind of still see where does this come from, right? Like we can't just like take all this data, turn it into a big pile of randomness and like not be able to trace it back. And finally, we want to be explicit about like the places where we can prove a thing if necessary in court and the places where we have done a little bit of guessing, where we've done a little bit of inference. Um, and so... 
this is open, what, what open sanctions looks like. You can imagine on the one hand, you've got all these kind of public data sources. Just this week, we reached 100 sources that we're incorporating. And then we're turning all of that data in one common format called follow the money. And um, that then allows us to aggregate the data by deduplicating all the entities in there, right? So like, if you think about Vladimir Putin, maybe again, as the most obvious, obvious example, he is now mentioned on 30 sanctions list or so on. Um, um, and um, these 30 sanctions lists all have their own identifier for Putin, right? So we're trying to integrate um, the, all, the, all the Putins of the world into sort of a integrated profile of like, um, all the information that exists about this entity. And then we can take that data and we can put it out into a variety of formats. We can just make it searchable using Elasticsearch, but much more fun, we can also put it into Neo4j as a graph and then run like some wild queries on it. Um, this is just like a very high level look at what Follow the Money is. It's an ontology, as the kind of talk title says, it's a model of about 70 or so things that um, journalists or activists or um, due diligence researchers and the money laundering professionals and uh, professionals are talking about the entire time. So they're talking about um, people, organizations, they're talking about real estate, vessels, aircraft, all these real world things. And then obviously also the connections between those things that help um, kind of weave a graph out of it. Ownership, association, family, directorship, business dealings, payments, all those kind of things that would then tell the story of what's happening between those entities. Um, and the, the way that, that we've kind of solved this in open sanctions and that um, for the money is, enables us to do it is to have an extremely sourced view of all the data, right? This is meeting the first requirement that I listed up there and um, saying, okay, for the birth date of um, this one individual, I think in this case, it's Evgeny Prigozhin, the former head of the Wagner Group. Um, you can see all the different theories that are there available about what the date of birth is. You can see from the Australian sanctions list, the Canadian, the British, the Swiss, etc., all the different source information. So this is really, really cool as a way of having lineage, as a way of having provenance on the data. But it's a mess if you're trying to query it, right? We're talking about 100 plus statement files that are all basically CSV files, um, 120 plus million individual statements like that. And if you think about just like, hey, I'm going to put this in a DuckDB and run some queries on it, um, every field query, every traversal is a full self join, right? So that's kind of a time you want to call on the professionals and you want to say, no, this is, actually needs to be a graph. And what I find really fun about uh, working with this as a graph is that there's like a liberty that comes taking the data in its kind of fully provenanced, um, nice day form and then boiling it down to a graph that I want to use to ask specific questions like the ones in the first slide. And so, for example, what we've done here is we've kind of simplified the data in the graph. Um, in some cases, for example, turning tags that exist on specific entities into labels in Neo4j, right? So you can see here on the side, there's oligarch um, quite in the center of the screen. An oligarch, of course, is a person, but it's a specific subtype of person. And so we can tag it out of the data that we have, and we can lift some of the data we have into these labels in order, in order to then be able to just like whip out some, uh, some cipher that really asks a question that a journalist would ask verbally as well. And um, another thing we can do is um, we can turn specific types of values of, of entities, for example, all of their names into nodes on, onto themselves, right? So we can say there's Vladimir Putin, the entity, but there's also the name Vladimir Putin. And what that allows us to do is to kind of um, do a little bit of data integration ad hoc by just saying we're going to make a node that joins all the entities that have the same name. So what does that, that allow us to do? It allows us to ask really fun questions. So for example, here um, you have, hey, show me all the paths that link a politician of the nationality of Russian to, uh, via five steps to an offshore and skip the offshores in the middle, addresses, politicians, or other people. So only the paths that go via corporate ownership, for example. And then give me a thousand and you get this massive hairball here. That's saying, okay, yeah, these are these, these are all the connections that um, uh, that exist that tie a politician to an offshore company. In, in this case, the attack offshore is applied to any company that's in the ICIJ data set of um, the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, etc. Um, 
the second sample query here that's like really nicely simple is just like give me all the things that are owned by sanctioned entities, right? And this is like a very, very relevant question because again, everything that is owned by a sanctioned company is also sanctioned, right? So in a way, these are all things that are implicitly sanctioned. There's like this fun term of shadow OFAC um, that, are, that are basically implicitly sanction companies that you can also then use in your risk assessment to say like is this um is this a company that i should also pr probably avoid doing business with and um, or that i'm legally required not to do business with to be more precise in those countries um and um i i i, I will also ask you forgiveness i'm a hobbyist cipher writer so i imagine there are some inefficiencies in the queries i'm showing here but i hope that my enthusiasm can make up for the for the lack of cipher um, query plan understanding. And the final kind of set of queries that I want to show here a little bit is um, uh, kind of these that involve name only labels, right? So we've, we've done data integration, but obviously the full graph of what we're building here has hundreds and hundreds of uh, millions of nodes. Um, and so um, we can't like fully integrate all of this stuff. And so the, the light blue nodes here in this graph are actually name only nodes, right? So in this case, um, one of the names is Peter Schneider. And I, I suspect there might be some other Germans in the audience. Peter Schneider is the John Smith of Germany, right? Um, or Andreas Ackermann. And so um, here we, we're kind of starting to get into the range of hypothesis of almost guessing a little bit or saying, yeah, yeah, if this Peter Schneider, if this John Smith is the same as this John Smith, then those are the then there's a real piece of corruption or of offshore and um, crime going on here. But obviously, yeah, this requires an analyst or a journalist to then dive in and say, "Hey, um, this is uh, this is a true link or it's a bad link. It's a it's a wrong hypothesis." Um, and so um, I'm already running out of time, so I just want to summarize a little bit what I was trying to say here is that. We're providing these open source components, both kind of follow the money. The software is entirely MIT licensed. There is the core library that contains the ontology and the ways of now modeling the data. There's the scripts here that are meant to help you convert follow the money data to Neo4j. There's open sanctions, which again is a open source um, due diligence database that um, uh, contains 100 or so sources of risk information. And this morning also, uh, there's, there's been a presentation about um, open screening, which is basically taking Link Curious and attaching it to the open, um, open sanctions data and then providing you a free way to experiment and browse a little bit through that data. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's just a very quick insight into that world. And I would also invite everyone who's interested down at the bottom, you can see there's opensanctions.org slash Slack. So if you're interested in playing with this, whether it is as an investigator or whether it is as someone who's working in anti-money laundering, in due diligence, in financial screening, um, yeah, please come and play with us. Um, I think I'll stop here and open for questions. Do we have any? Oh, someone has been very kind and asked, what's the most impressive use of open sanctions that you've seen? I think. Um, the most impressive use of open sanctions has been actually the Ukrainian government. They, they've been using the data to um, sort of reconcile the application of sanctions by different countries. Um, so saying, hey, the Swiss have not yet sanctioned these hundred people, these hundred people that are involved in, in Russian politics that have already been added um, uh, by the Americans, for example, to the sanctions list, right? And so they're using the, the, the data linkage as a way of saying, hey, Switzerland, time for you to include these people on your list and to, to remove them from your financial system. Or, hey, um, uh, Europe, here's like 50 people that should be added to the European sanctions list. Um, that's sort of also like a nice use of data integration, I think. Any more questions? <laughs>